All right, all right. Peace, family. How you doing? Uh, EMO Tap. We're going to <clears throat> we're gonna read uh, essay number 14 of Chinwezu's articles. We actually skipped quite a few. Um, if anybody goes back and reads anything um, you think is interesting, uh, let me know. I actually, like, I prefer this type, you know, the example of Meiji Japan over the necrophobia one. Um, but, like, if you see anything like of, like, this quality particularly, um, then definitely, you know, let me know. Uh, I kind of skipped through all these kind of stuff. I'm not really too interested in, like, you know, reparations arguments and so forth or Arab colonialism per se. Um, you know, although, actually, this is actually pretty interesting. Although this is long, so I'm not even, uh, I'm not really thinking. This one's supposed to be 20 pages. And I want to tell you guys this, actually. So Tan's Zan should be live on Swahili Nation. Uh, I'm typing in the chat. I think around like 2 p.m. So I would say that we should, uh, I should try to wrap this up pretty quickly, you know? Um, so I, I wanted to make a graphic showing the different like regular schedules that we have. Like Matron is gonna be Monday at eight o'clock um, Eastern time. Um, I'm of course uh, 11 a.m. and uh, on, Saturday, on Sunday and uh, a bit of medicine is Friday. Uh, no, sorry, Saturday, wait, what was it? Saturday at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, so I, I would definitely like recommend you guys to look into that. Um, there's other, obviously there's other programs, but you, why I, I bring that up is to say that, um, yeah, they might, might not be regular programming, but uh, so definitely we're gonna try to be quick. So we're gonna go to this 210. So I can actually just search 210. Hopefully that's gonna show up. Nope, 2100. Um, good, my hand page 210. So all right, let's do it. Um, it says Black World League 1 and 2, towards a Black World League of Nations, Communities, and States, right? Uh, this is a paper for the 7th PAC in Kampala, so that's Uganda. Um, so this, this brother is just traveling Africa, promoting the word of Garvey, and yet, like, most of us are sleeping on him, you know? Uh, let's go. Objectives. The Black World League of Nations. See, this is what I'm saying. Like, you don't want the AU. You don't want the African Union. You want the Black World League, right, of nations, communities, and states aims to guarantee the survival, security, sovereignty, prosperity, and dignity of the black race. Its motto is black unity, autonomy, and one destiny. It shall be an organ of black civilization, effective in the daily life of the black peoples of the world. It shall serve as a center for harmonizing actions for social reconstruction, economic cooperation, industrialization, the resolution of inter-black conflict, cultural advancement and autonomy in the black world, and for the collective defense of the shores, lands, and skies of the black world. You know, look, I want to tell you guys this. So one of the mottos in my book, right, is um, one of the art, one of the one of the mottos in my book. I just see some people are inside. So learning curves says greetings, everybody. Kofi says greetings. Trigger happy plus uh, says I'm trying to read all the articles in order. I've read the debt relief one, which is just explaining the scam of IMF and countries selling their reserves. Um, Trigger happy says I'm gonna see if the Meiji one is on par with the reparations one. Nah, Meiji is really good, bro. Uh, Meiji is really good. Uh, I read Meiji two days ago. It is really good. Um, uh, I, I skipped the reparation stuff because, you know, I, I just know we're not getting it. But, uh, <laughs> like, like, we're not, like, what the fuck, you know? Uh, what I could say is this, though. See, this is what I, one of the models in my book is nothing works in, no, all that works, works, and works, okay? Or, like, something like, but before I think I say that, I think something, something along the lines of, um, like, theory doesn't amount to anything, you know? Like, there's no Black World League. You know, this, is, this was presented in the PAC, so I go to the Pan-African community or something, right? In Kampala, in Uganda, in 1994. At the time, I guess, you know, if you guys want to know how old I am, um, like, I could have... Yeah, well, it's not important. But the point is that I was, like, a, like a toddler, more or less, right? Um, he presented this paper in 1994. Nothing... There's no Black World League, you know? There's no Black World League of Nations. It doesn't matter what you think. 
Like, it doesn't matter how good your theories are if there are no works associated with it. And, like, today, so I have this. I actually want to show you guys this. I, I was thinking about, should I show you guys this? I want to show you guys this. So this is just an experience I had earlier today. Um, this is an experience I had earlier today where, well, not earlier today, but, you know, earlier in the week where I I was, uh, what do you call it? And by the way, for those people who want to just read the book straightforward, just go read the book straightforward. Don't, don't, don't bother me. You know, <laughs> like don't, just don't bother me. Uh, uh, I, I had this experience on um, where somebody asked me to help them with this writing, right? So I'm going to give you guys a short reading, and it's going to be uh, very quickly, right? So this is my, my Twitter. Make sure you guys follow it. Um, and it's like a friend asked me to help with her friend's How I Met My Husband to be story. I took a dull, uninteresting voice note testimony and made it into a romantic short story. My friend nearly cried, jokingly proposed to me and asked why I wasn't an author. Her friend called her and during my friend, and during my friend started sending me screenshots of other stories. I figured maybe I missed a detail. Yes, the complaint wasn't read too well, almost like a novel and there are no smileys or remediality. I was reminded why I'm no longer an author. You know, the moral, this is what's important, talent is 5% of it, you know? What the buyer wants is 95%, okay? Talent is 5% of it, what the buyer wants is 95%. If you can recognize the market demands, you'll do better than even those you think should do well. So press on with market research, and if you can, stomach compromise. Then I jokingly add a smiley, right? You know, to say that, oh, look at this market compromise. Of course, realistically speaking, I could probably, like you see, there's no there's no real engagement. I think uh, Revolutionary Matron, shout out to um, her, she did uh, like it. But you see there's no engagement. Now, if I, I could probably actually write this story again. I was thinking about it writing the story again with smileys all through and laughs and blah 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 and maybe it would get a little more engagement you know but but that's 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 life so you you go back to this um to this you know hey look this is the big proposal you know we're going to have a black you you got to ask yourself what do these nations want what is the market for these nations because what these nations want are products are western products and if you can't guarantee western products they don't want to work with you and the thing is this, that you can make Western products. But you have to position yourself as an African people to make those Western products, in a sense. You know, so easily, if, if I mean, I don't know what Chin Weizu, uh does professionally, uh, per se. I mean, I believe it's writing, but it could be something else. But let's say if he's an industrialist and he's uh, creating, like he has, a, he has a car manufacturing plant, whatever, right? He can bond, with, he could sell to black nations in that sense, in that way. And if you have like, a, like you could do a lot of stuff like a Silicon Valley type thing, right? You could market to various black nations, you know, on the collective defense so on and so forth. But you have to, it's like nothing, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a quote, nothing works in theory. All that works, works in works, okay? Uh, so, so just remember that because it's kind of like, I don't want us to get into this where we uh, uh, think. So, uh, so Tanzan says peace. Tanzan came in, and uh, I do want to just remind you guys. So Tanzan's going to be on Swahili Nation. Swahili Nation is it on at two p.m. Eastern time, or is it on uh, three p.m. Eastern time? I'm not hundred percent sure, but um, you should get a graphic for it so I could post it in the middle of the chat. Uh, Trigger Happy says, I never understood either why we even push for continentalism when even Pan Europeanism doesn't include all of their nations. Uh, it's because the the, the 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 Arabs pushed it. That's what that's what that's what uh, Chinwezu was saying. So they pushed it so that they can get Africa's resources, you know, and it's just smart for them. Uh, Trigger Happy says, but added to that, North Africa isn't the same as us, regardless of the dispute of their indigeneity or whether they are settlers. They are not racially us. Yeah, exactly. It, but you got to ask who's pushing it. You know what I mean, Trigger Happy? Uh, the person, the people pushing it, are the Arabs. So if I were Arab. Yes, I would push for continental African union, unity. That just makes a lot of damn sense. You know? Why would I push for North African? No, I, no, see, the way how it works was that the Arabs were first pushing for Arab unity. But when the Arab world, you know, to the east, said, nah, I'm not messing with you guys because y'all are actually in Africa, right? Then they said, okay, we'll do a continental unity. That's, that's the, like, like I, I didn't look it up recently, but that's like pretty much a good summary that we could probably go by. All right, let's go, let's just rush through so that we can 
catch Tanzan later. So membership. Membership shall be open only to the black states, nations, and communities in Africa and the three black diaspora, the Transatlantic, the Trans-Sahara, and the Trans-Indian Ocean. So the Trans-Indian Ocean, I think he's talking um, like the, the ancient um, Indus Valley civilization type stuff. So that's, oh, maybe not, but maybe, you know. Principal organs, its directing organ shall be, one, the Black World Congress of Nations, Communities, and States, the highest policy body of the BWL, which shall meet every five years. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is actually really infrequent, but again, you know, this is the thing. We have to realize that nothing works in theory. This is a good idea. You could say, hey, you know what, let's, you know, as a, as a, as a universe, you know, as, as a galaxy, as a Milky Way galaxy, humans and... Um, you know, alterions, you know, like whatever, right? You know what I'm saying? Should meet up every 20 years to discuss the direction of the galaxy. It's not going to happen just because you said it. You know what I mean? Like, if you do not have the infrastructure to meet with these altarians or whatever these extraterrestrials you may call them, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, it just doesn't matter. And that's, that's like one of the issues. I mean, I do see the value in writing it out. You know, I do think it's a, a good thing, but we have to honestly be soldiers on the floor and then we also have to do our market research like i said i could write a good like this is a good thing this is good but it's if if nobody wants it if the black nations themselves don't want it you know if they if they want to be under Gaddafi, and it's, instead of under Nkrumah, or, or i guess Nkrumah wants to be under Gaddafi, but if they want to be under Gaddafi instead of niere uh then there you have it you know number two the standing committee of the bwc which shall guide the bwl between the sessions of the assembly and the black world secretariat other organs shall include the Black World High Command to coordinate defense. But I mean, th there is a lot of value in all this because he's going to give you, um, he's going to give you a lot of things. It looks like, right? So Black World High Command. This is military. The Economic Reconstruction Council. That's the economy. The Peace and Arbitration uh, uh, Commission. That's like internal peace. The Black World Bank. That's again, you know, more uh, economy, economics. The Black World Academy of Knowledge, Pure and Applied. So. This is really important. Like I said in my in my uh, in my book. Uh, so by the way, if you guys don't know, and I'll, I'll probably open up a page later. But if you guys don't know, I wrote the book of power. So in my book, I do talk about the different disciplines, and this is kind of touching onto it as well. You know, so the Black Academy of like this is really important. This is really critical. You know, uh, 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 a place for your people to learn, right? Is 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 of the utmost, right? Uh, the Council of Black World Religions. You know, religion is actually important. I don't know if you guys remember, I did have this debate where I was actually, like a lot of people think I'm an atheist or something, but I was actually defending spirituality, you know? Uh, so the Council of Black World Religions, because it's important, it's important. You know, our people are, uh, like Garvey was saying in, in uh, make sure you guys read that, uh, Philosophies and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. I think it's Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey, the volume three. Um, he was saying, yeah, like our people are religious, you know? And it's not just our people, everybody's religious. You know, we don't know this, like what's like what's the meaning of life what this universe is i don't necessarily buy into it um and i don't think anybody really should but you know allegorically there is some sort of structure and order and there are a lot of questions you know uh, like like when somebody dies why do you have dreams of them such vivid dreams no less um trigger happy says yep agreed agreed um agreed okay uh yeah i mean thank you you know the Number 10, the Anti-Negrophobia Society to Campaign Against Negrophobia in All Its Forms. So Negrophobia, for those who don't know, is, is black hate. Um, the Council of Black Culture, which shall promote solid knowledge of black civilization and cultures, and institutionalize the 10 yearly Black World Festival of the Arts. So in my first book, Zubiri, the first published book, I, I try to do once a year uh, for a festival. But again, like I said, it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter what you think if it doesn't actualize into anything, you know? I mean, fortunately, Zuberi is just a fiction book, so it actualizes for them just like, um, you know, The Hobbit, you know, whatever. You know, Lord of the Rings actualizes for The Hobbit or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's not, not real, but, you know, for them in that world, you know, that, that boy's looking for that ring, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, uh, number 12, the Black World Games, so that's like Olympics thing, um, which is not that, it's important, I guess. I mean, it's not that important, but... Um, I mean, black people like it, you know. The Black Ankh Brigade for Emergency Relief and Rehabilitation, in which shall have the Ankh, the comedic cross and symbol of life for its emblem. The Black Pioneer Movement for the Afrocentric Orientation of the Very Young. So this is actually pretty interesting. Um, 
No, actually, this is different. But but Carlos Cook's organization was something like the Black Pioneer Movement. I can't remember what it was called, but it's something like that. Number 15, the Black Shield Organization for Community Self-Protection and Leadership Training of the Youth. So the case for the BWL. So it looks like he might just justify everything, which is really good, like really helpful. So at the heart of the multitude of problems of the black world is one sad fact. We have lost internal control of our societies at every level, the mind, the family, the village, the town, the economic production unit, the state, and also lost control of our external economic, political, military, and cultural relations. The white world, Europeans, as well as Arabs, control us and meddle in our affairs all the way down into our soup, soup pots, thoughts, and dreams, right? They basically provide their food for us. When the BWL is operational, no aspect of our lives would be open to control or direction by other races, you know? And, and again, you know, this kind of statement, though, I, I don't want to say that it's, it's, it's irrelevant to say this kind of stuff. It's just unfortunate that you w he would have said all this stuff and we haven't acted on it. Um, but there, in the Meiji article, the Japanese are like propagandizing against Wazungu, you know, against Wazungu's dominion, and they're saying things like this too, like, no, we don't want any foreign control in our land. But the thing is that the Japanese are a state, and they're listening to themselves. Um, uh, hold on a second, I just uh, okay, I was, I was checking. The Trigger Happy said only heard it from the audio, so I wasn't sure if he meant he couldn't hear me. Uh, Trigger Happy says. I kind of find it value in a working framework, but again, nothing material. Material is what it realized, while theory is what plans and organizes material. Material is what makes theory valuable, because material is tangible. Apparently, his decolonizing the African mind, which I want to get but money, he talks about how the World Cup and other cultural games contribute to imperialism. That's what he must be alluding to, only heard it from a video. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, well, let's see if it's on, uh, let's see if it's not like out of print and overpriced, but I'm thinking about um, definitely, I think definitely, you know, getting his 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 collection is a is a good idea. The BWL institutionalizes the solidarity of the black race. L what is the BWL? I thought he was going to explain it, so I didn't look back to see what the BWL was. Um, but let's just see what the BWL is because he's kind of he looks like he's talking more about it. Um, oh, okay, the Black World League. Okay, okay. Okay, I thought he was going to go into each individual thing, but apparently he's just talking about the whole thing. The BWL institutionalized the solidarity of the black race. Those who suffer together on account of their race must organize together to end their suffering. Those who are attacked uh, because of the skin color must organize and fight back together. This is a simple rule of life. The BWL would remedy the dangerous absence of a black world organization and address our manifest need for collective security in its critical dimensions, economic, military, and territorial. So that's what I like, though. You see how... Yes, like uh, during so during the uh, enemies within, I talked about security. You know, uh, Trigger Happy was there, so shout out to Trigger Happy. Trigger Happy was like, "What is the meaning of all this if you know we don't have the same culture across different countries?" You know, and again, I don't make the assumption that I will have the exact same culture as everybody inside of Africa because that just like it's just not realistic, right? But the idea that we could like they could work for like I could work towards their collective security and they could work towards my collective security on the basis of us being a hunted and abused people is really what it's all about you know what I mean it's not about the fact that we already have the same culture it's the fact that I can definitely assimilate into their culture you know what I mean uh it's not that I already think that I have the same culture as them it's that I know that I'm willing to give up my uh, you know, westernized culture in order to secure my security. And, and actually, I was talking to a, a friend about that, like how all of us as human beings uh, go between comfort and security. You know what I mean? Like we sacrifice our comfort for our security, you know? And like the classic example is this. Some, well, I mean, not for you, not for the men per se. I was, I was talking to a lady, I guess. And, and maybe it's not even for the ladies or whatever, right? But, you know, if somebody breaks into your home, you're perfectly fine with hiding in the closet until they leave. You know what I mean? Or if they like, like, cause I'm saying hiding in the closet cause that's uncomfortable, right? But, or you could even say you're perfectly comfortable with shooting the person in the chest uh, uh, until they leave, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> right? Until they leave the planet. And so you're breaking your comfort zone cause maybe you don't want to shoot people in the chest, but you're going to do that for your security. You know what I mean? So there's always that, comfort security dichotomy um 
Um, and you know that that question came from a, a different place, but I I just wanted to share that with you guys. Let's see what the comments are. No comments. So I'm um, thing. I'm appreciating the likes though. We got five likes and four concurrent leader uh, listeners. So thank you so much for going up and you know just up and and up and you know up and leaving. I mean some of you just you know let's listen to it later. And I appreciate that. You know sometimes you guys drop comments. I appreciate that as well. So thank you. Uh, the BWL recognizes diversity of political and cultural units in the black world, states, pre-colonial nations, or ethnic groups, diaspora, communities. See the diversity, like that's what she's saying. And gives them representation. In particular, the DWL consciously brings into the fold of black solidarity the trans-Indian ocean diaspora, which is usually left out of account in pan-Africanism. So that's an interesting you know, distinction. A lot of people, like for instance, when I used to say this stuff, people would get on my ass about that. Like, they're not Africans. And so, you know, it's just interesting that um, Chinwezi would say that. And and you got to realize that some people are going to disagree with you on this. And some people are going to agree with you on this. And it's like, it doesn't even fucking matter what you agree with or disagree with. It's what do you work towards? You know, if you can build this nice nation and it doesn't include these other people, that's fine. If you can build this nice nation and it does include these people, that's fine. Like, like literally, it's it's a it's a comfort security dichotomy. I might be shit. I might even put that as an article in my uh, my book. So. Um, we'll see, right? So the BWL is the natural institution embodiment of Pan-Africanism, which George Padmore, the principal organizer of the 5th PAC, so he's saying this at the 7th PAC, so he's like the 5th PAC in Manchester in 1945, defined as an independent political expression of Negro aspirations for complete national independence from white domination, capitalist or communist. So this guy wasn't even about capitalism or communism. Now, I, 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 I look, Y'all know I'm a math guy, right? Fifth PAC was in 1945 in Manchester. Seventh PAC is in Kampala in 1994. Okay, so I know you're like, what? Hold on a second. So you do the math that's 49 years later, all right? So we're just gonna scroll up. I should press page up, okay? Uh, we're just gonna scroll up. 1994, this is the seventh PAC. So they only had one more between for 40 years. Like this is how much we decline. Any serious people, if there's a serious commitment, like like even this whole, oh, we're going to meet every five years is a little bit too infrequent for me, you know? I mean, I mean, especially since we don't have it. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, maybe that's okay. But if you don't have something and you need something, meeting once every 25 years or something is not going to make it happen. I mean, like, like... And then here's the thing, like, is there even an eighth PAC? And we're gonna we're gonna freaking jokingly put up an eighth PAC, like like 20 years from now or some shit. Like like we need to like come on, like this is what I'm saying. Like nothing works in theory. All that works works and works. This is why I I, I you know some 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 people will be like, why are you pushing your own book? You just read your fucking book in front of you. Yeah, I will. It's just that you know I'm pissed off sometimes. You know I'm pissed off sometimes, right? Uh. But comfort and, and security, that's what you thats what you want to focus on in your life um, for people. Uh, let me see if there's any... Let me just see. Yeah, I'm just, like, pissed off. Let me see what the comments are like. Um, uh, only so far... Let me see. Well, I was trying to say that at some point you have to relate, adopt to their culture, so it isn't an entirely useless endeavor. But I clarify that it's useless in America, so it made more sense. Yeah. No, bro, I'm, look, we, we don't, you know, we're not arguing, man. Um, uh, Trigger Happy says, wait, I'm not sure what he means by trans diaspora. I think he's talking about the, in this valley. So like basically the people who were, uh, transported, um, over the Sahara. Oh, no, sorry. Over the Sahara. So that's like going to the Arabs, like going to the Arabia, the Africans of the, the Africans who were, uh, uh, to, to, you know, who went to the Arab world. Uh, then the transatlantic means those who went over the Atlantic ocean. So that's going to be the, the, you know, the traditional African diaspora that we know of, like the Western African diaspora. And then the trans-Indian Ocean will be, like basically just means over or through the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and that would be the people who went to the um, India and so forth. You know, so sometimes there were Africans that were transported to India. But he's saying that we left those people out. The ones who went to East, eastward, we left them out and we kind of focused on the people who went west. Uh, but of course, the people who went east went a long, long time ago. Um, so, sort of, somewhat, you know? Uh, every year, probably better or no. I mean, the, the, the issue is that because we're not doing anything, like, it doesn't even matter if we fucking meet. You know what I mean? 
Um, like, like realistically, yes, it would be better if, but it, it, the best thing would be if we were doing things or if we were in a position to hold leverage over these groups, but because we're not, it's like, eh, you know, like, 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 it's like, like, what do you expect? You know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, to find this on so far, BWL is the appropriate 21st century vehicle for the Pan-African movement's traditional role as articulated demands and needs of the Negro race and for its paramount concern to ensure that the Negro race should develop and unhindered, unhindered by other races. Give me two seconds. I'm going to just type. I'm just going to type something really quickly. All right. All right. Never mind. Okay. That's it. Very quickly. Right. Uh, let's go back. Um. The BWL is also the natural institutional embodiment of the Gari movement, which, in Du Bois' words, was a people's movement to unite the Negroes of the world. The BWL is also the natural institutional embodiment of the Negritude movement, such black cultural affirmation movements as the Negro Renaissance in the 1920s, USA, indigenism in Haiti, and Negrism in Cuba in the 1920s, and the 1930s and the Francophone Negritude movement in the 1930s and 1940s, the Black Consciousness movement of the 1970s in South Africa, and their offspring and successors. The BDML is thus the uh, institutional vehicle for uniting the black world behind a shared set of vital and enduring aspirations. Now, see what I'm saying? Like this right here, I would have left this paragraph out. I would have left the paragraph out. I mean, I mean, it's a good paragraph to show that you have your roots. But again, like it's it's about market research. Do people even care if you're continuing these movements that have died? You know what I mean? Do people even care? Uh, I mean, it's good to say that okay, he's informed on these movements, right? And like, it's good to share that indigenism in uh, Haiti, negrism, francophone negritude, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, these are good movements. But again, um, like, do people even care? It's like it's it's really about what do people care about? So let's say, it perhaps needs to be emphasized that Pan-Africanism was founded as a movement of blacks for the advancement of the black race, and Du Bois, on account of its history, given in his opening address to the 5th PAC in Manchester, we find... So, actually, he's talking to the PAC, so maybe people do care, but, you know. Um, in Du Bois' own account of its history... Yeah, sorry for that, I just ate... I just tried to eat something really quickly. In Du Bois' own account of its history, given in in his opening address to the 5th PAC in Manchester, we find the demands of the earlier Pan-African Congresses uh, described as the demands of the Negro race. Um, specifically, those of the 2nd PAC are introduced by the phrase, the Negro race, through their thinking intelligentsia, demand. Similarly, the resolutions of the 4th PAC begin with the phrase, Negroes everywhere need. The resolution of the 1st PAC to contains the phrase, the Negroes of the world demand. And see, like, like we're making demands, we're making, we're telling our needs. And yet, we're, like, like why, like, my thing is this, I'm telling you this truthfully. I don't want to be involved in this stuff. I want to live like other people and have a have a decent life where I just enjoy, you know, collective security. But I don't. You understand? I don't enjoy security from black people. I don't enjoy a black culture around me. You know, uh, partly because I'm, you know, obviously in the West, but but also partly because of of just this, the situation of uh, uh, abroad as well. You know. Uh, I don't want to be doing this, but but like we like you know you have to do this, but that is why I'm saying we can't we can't keep playing games, you know. I tell other people, you know, it's time for an amateur hour is over. So you know, seriously, like let's do this, right? So the resolution of the first uh, PAC contained the phrase "the Negroes of the world demand," and those of the third PAC are studied with the phrase "black folks, black Africans, blacks." Nowhere do the resolutions of these four congresses, by Du Bois' own report, say the Negroes and Arabs demand or the Negroes and Boers demand, or the Negroes of the world and the white settlers in Africa demand. The racial constituency of Pan-Africanism must be kept at all lines, from Pan-Africanism loses its point, its reason for being, its potency, if it loses its black identity. So that was the first one. So he was just talking um, about the, well, I don't know, was he in the, so he says Lagos, Nigeria, so I'm not even sure if he was there, which is just like even worse, honestly. Let's just double check, because it seems like if he's saying that, like he's saying it was Lagos, Nigeria, a paper, yeah, so it was a paper, that's, that's what I'm telling you, like, do you guys, you guys get what I'm saying? Like, this is the issue with us as a people, like, he wasn't even, now this is one of the better minds we've come across uh, for the 21st century, okay? One of the better minds we've come across from the 21st century, and he's not even there at the Pan-African Congress. 
So they not only do they have the Pan African Congress fifty freaking years later after the fifth Pan African Congress. So maybe there's one between. Who cares, right? Not only do they have one fifty years or two in fifty years, but when they have this brilliant mind, he's not even there. He's like sending a paper from Legos. And then on top of sending a paper from Legos, there's no real appeal here. He's like, hey, why is it that your shit is Arab pretty much? You're supposed to be black. It's supposed to be black, 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 black. That's all we've ever been about, black, black, black. And it's like, yeah, who gives a shit? Because the African Union is still running. Oh, my gosh. All right. I'm not even going to tell the joke I would usually tell. So he says, look, for a black world league of nations, so part two, he's like, I'm going to make another appeal, and it's probably from Lagos again, right? Uh, he's going to make another appeal. Let me see. Um, looks like I got a comment on, uh, no, okay. Looks like I got a comment on uh, Twitter, but it's not to do with uh, this. Let's see. Um, Trigger Happy says, okay. Every, every year probably better. Yeah, I said, yeah. All right. Trigger Happy says, okay, so he means like the diaspora and the Mena region or in Asia. Yeah, like whoever crossed the Indian Ocean. So some of us went across the Atlantic Ocean. That's what we mostly associate with the African diaspora. Some of us across the Sahara Ocean. You know, those are the ones who were like the slaves to the Arabs at this moment. Oh, sorry, not the Sahara Ocean, the Sahara Desert. And then uh, some people crossed the Indian Ocean, which is people who went to like India and stuff, or Asia, like you say. So, I don't know what Mena region is, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't remember that, but yeah. Um, Tanzan says, wow, two meetings in 40 years, right? Tanzan, that's more meetings than we had. So, it's not that impressive. No, I'm joking. <laughs> you know, the delectable Tanzan! No, okay. All right. Uh, Tanzan, you still didn't tell us when your program is. Uh <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble, yo. That, that dude was on Tanzan's program. Who's gonna be on Tanzan's program later is gonna be like, who the f is this? Uh, <laughs> my plans for the Pan African Congress of 1919, as they developed, had in them nothing spectacular, no revolutionary. If in decades or a century they resulted in. Oh, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this right here. Look. My plans for the Pan African Congress of 1919, as they developed, had in them nothing spectacular, no revolutionary. If in decades or a century they resulted in such world organization of black men as would oppose a united front to European aggression, that certainly would not have been beyond my dream. But on the other hand, in practical reality, I knew the power and guns of Europe and America, and what I wanted to do was in the face of this power to sit down hand in hand with colored groups and across the council table to learn of each other, our condition, our aspirations, our chance of concerted thought. And You know, it's a good thing the camera's not on, because, like, you would have seen the, like, you would have seen the life leave my face, you know? So what is he saying? Because, like, I was reading it, like, I totally, like, you know, you heard my tone. I thought it was something good. I thought it was, I thought maybe it was a critique of something. No. He's saying to you, look at this, look at this. He's like, look, I had plans that weren't really revolutionary, right? And I, I thought, you know, if in decades it would result in an organization of black people, opposing European aggression, you know, that, uh, that certainly would not, like, like that's, 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 you know, that's, that's good. But he's like, in practical reality, in the real world, I knew that Europeans had guns and so forth. And what I wanted to do, what my real objective was, as W.B. Du Bois, who's a mulatto, okay, as W.B. Du Bois, what I really wanted to do was in the face of their power, sit down hand in hand with oh with with colored with other colored groups and uh, across the council table to learn of each other our condition our aspiration our chance to concern it oh actually maybe it's not as bad as i thought um i think maybe he's saying he wants to sit down with the colored groups so that's i thought he wanted to sit down with his wazungu so all right maybe it's not as bad i don't know it's really whatever um you know at the end of the day, look, the other people, they were serious. The Chinese, the Indians. Like, there's this conference called the Bandung Conference. You guys, actually, I think I have that podcast. So I did talk about that in one of these podcasts, all right? I talked about, um, so Carlos Cooks writes about the Bandung Conference. And he says that uh, the Bandung Conference, they chose, like, the, the Asians and the Africans, and they all got together to have a revolutionary discussion 
on how to free themselves from white colonialism, right? And they did not, they purposely didn't invite African Americans, okay? And the reason why they didn't invite African Americans because they knew damn well that African Americans would run back and tell the white American all the secret plans, okay? And sure enough, uh, one of these African Americans did did go, and it was uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who's also a mulatto, right? He shows up and he starts lecturing in front of these. Um, they, they they give him a room to lecture in front of, and it's like a bunch of school kids because they're like, "Who the fuck are you?" Like, no, we're not giving you any of the plans. He goes and lectures in front of these school kids, and when they ask, "Hey, what country are you from?" He's like, "I'm from the United States," and they kind of laugh and leave the room, right? The kids do, and this is what Carl St. Cox is telling us. And then when, and you're like, okay, well, that's embarrassing. You shouldn't treat African-Americans that way. It's like, yeah, okay, you think that, right? Carl, Adam Clinton Powell Jr. goes back into America, okay? He goes back into America, and he holds a press conference to say what he heard at the Bandung Conference. You know, and I, I'm not I'm not saying it's, it's, it's due with the... Uh, African Americans per se, but first off, why are mulattoes your your scholars? One, uh, why are they your representatives? And Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was really popular in America, like women were swooning over this dude, and he's mad mid, he's mad mediocre, right? Uh, two, I mean, he was a politician, so I mean, I could see that, but again, he was mediocre. Uh, uh, he was a good politician though, but uh, you know, for what it's worth, right? But the the thing is, uh, like like what are you what are you what are you betraying the, the the global movement for? You know, and I mean of course it's not it's not every African American. I'm not nobody would say that, right? But it's a it's a it's a reality that you know like what we want. Oh, so so what he's saying is this. Look, so actually that's what it is. So what he's saying is, look, I would have loved the black organization, but I realized, you know. We could have a colored organization, which is not like, like again, it's re it's realistic. I'm not gonna hold you guys. Uh, it's realistic, so I, I can't necessarily knock them. And and it's it's like realistically, these Asians, it did work out for them. You know what I mean? Like the Bandung Conference did work out for them, and it and it technically worked for African people too because African people did get their liberation. But you know, we have to we have to push it forward. We have to push it forward. Sorry, I'm taking a little time on that one. So let's go. As far as Negroes are concerned, in America, we have the problem of lynching, peonage, and disenfranchisement. In the West Indies, South, and Central America, we have a problem of peonage, serfdom, industrial and political governmental inequality. And in Africa, we have not only peonage and serfdom, but outright slavery, racial exploitation, and alien political monopoly. We cannot allow a continuation of these crimes against our race. So Garvey is just going to tell you what an IS is, right? Some of asked me why I keep saying IS is. Uh, it's just mathematics is a sad and it's funny. All right. So what ought to be the night? What ought to be Nigeria's position on a proposal that has been making the rounds of African capitals for the past year or so? A proposal to create an organization of Black African states. So I think he's talking about his own proposal. But he said, "I have long held." But although maybe he's not. Maybe this is what it is. He's like, "What should Nigeria do about this organization of Black African states?" Right. I have long held that some such organization is a geopolitical necessity, is long overdue, and should have been the natural culmination in Africa of the worldwide Pan-Africanist movement of the first half of the 20th century. Why that movement petered out by the 1950s, why such an organization was not created when the black African countries got independence, and why an Afro-Arab forum, the OAU, was deemed an adequate substitute for that organization, is a case study in African failure to uphold cardinal principles. One joke has it that Nasser slightly gave Nkrumah an Arab wife, and Nkrumah couldn't see straight after that on Pan-Africanism. Up till Manchester, the Pan-African world from Nkrumah meant the black world. So up until Manchester, so he's talking about um, the fifth conference. Let's see if the footnote is here. Yeah, so the fifth Pan-African conference, um, he was like, yo, it's about the black world. But after Fatia, his wife, what just happened? I just did comments by mistake. My fault. Ah, uh, whatever. Who cares? Oh, I probably could just undo. Uh, let me just do that quickly before I... All right. It meant the African landmass with its Arab and African dwellers. So after he got this wife, and with Nkrumah championing it, that had been the reigning version of Pan-Africanism ever since. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't you know, 
uh, shout out to this, this is brother on uh, Twitter from Ghana, who's like, uh, oh, oh, Tanzan better not be talking about me being disgusted. True, you all should have heard Tanzan yesterday on the learning curve. Make sure y'all go check it out. Tanzan started cussing. All right. Uh, so she said 3 p.m. Eastern, um, and she's gonna talk accountability. So let's go back up though. Um, learning curve says we keep talking about the issues, problems, and solutions, but we don't usually see ourselves in an economic position to change things. But we are in an economic position to change things. Exactly. Right. We 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 have to. Trigger Happy says Middle Eastern and North Africa. There are at least like three million black people in Yemen, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, multiple black ethnicities in North Africa, although small in numbers um yeah yeah so i think that i think that might be the trans-saharan though you know um i'm thinking trans-indian ocean might be the people in like india like you know like the the dalit you know um or the the untouchables in india that kind of stuff um maybe even like the austral no not the australians but that, that that kind of stuff that's what i'm thinking is the difference between the trans-saharan and the trans-indian ocean uh Trigger Happy says, basically, the integration is grounded of Pan-Africanism that is foundational, which is why there is no surprise as to why it's very multiracial. Yeah. Tanzan says, Oni is so disgusted by our lack of progress as a people. Now, nah, you guys got to listen to Tanzan. Make sure you guys check her out uh, later, 3 p.m. Says, thanks for the program pro- promo. I will be on 12 Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, talking accountability. Uh, she says, they knew it. They knew they would go run and tell. Yeah, they knew they'd run and tell. And that's the thing. Like, y'all listen to that um, Carlos Cook's thing that I, I like, either read the Carlos Cook's book I can't remember what the name of the essay is, but um, you can listen to me. I'm, I'm trying to do my accent, you know, my Caribbean accent to a uh, thing. Although I don't know what a Dominican accent sounds like, so, you know, but I, I did it anyway. I am black. Uh, I'm glad that at last an organization that would reflect the proper sense of Pan-African is being seriously considered, even if a quarter of a century late. Better late than never. However, now that we seem about to do it, and like and we didn't, you see what I'm saying? We seem about to do it, and we didn't. But we should take pay- pains to do it correctly, which is why I would suggest that the objective ought to be a black world league of nations embracing all black states in the world, not just those in Africa. Let me explain why. The context of the discourse is a great and enduring competition between the major races of the human species, whether some of us want to acknowledge it or not. So the context of this discourse is the great and enduring competition between the major races of the human species. Whether some of us want to acknowledge it or not, the competition has been on for thousands of years under various disguises and has been a decisive factor in international relations ever since the different races of the species came into conflict for land and the Earth's resources. Those who ignore that competition for land, resources, wealth, power, and prestige do so at their own peril. For what chance have they of winning a war who don't know or choose not to acknowledge that it's already on and far advanced. In that long contest, there's been four main teams, the white or Caucasian race, the yellow or Mongolian race, the black or African race, and the red or Amerindian race. That's how I say American Indian too. Uh, We may for now leave out of account of the population produced by miscegenation between the primary races, such as the brown people of India, who are the result of some 4,000 years of miscegenation between white Aryan invaders from the region of Iran and the autochthonous, uh, the autochthonous Dravidian blacks of the Indian subcontinent. So I think these are the ones he's talking about with the Indian Ocean, the the Dravidian blacks. In the four-way contest, so he's like, look, we could leave out the Indians, the brown people who are not, who are like a mixed race, right? Um, in the four-way contest, the Reds have been the worst of it, having, no, have had the worst of it, having been virtually exterminated, right? The blacks have had its second worst, having been invaded and decimated their homeland, carted out all over the place for enslavement and dominated by all comers, especially the West European and the Semitic branches of the white race. So the Semitic branches being the, um, the, uh, Arabs, right? So the yellows have come off second best, having been able to defend their East Asian homeland from all corners without being exterminated, without being dispersed for enslavement. Those who have come off best thus far are the whites. From their relatively small homeland in West Eurasia, they have spread out and taken over more than half of the Earth's landmass. With their seizure of so much land, their population exploded till now they now make up well over one third of humanity. Furthermore, they have now, of course, they no longer make up one third because the uh, the Asians are pretty big, 
by uh, one third of humanity. Furthermore, they have imposed their political, military, economic, and cultural power upon the whole earth to the extent that whites control at least 95% of the earth's known resources. And the two current superpowers are white. So I don't know when he wrote this, but he's talking about the, um, the Russians and the, and the, uh, and the, and the, uh, whatever they're called. Um, Americans, yeah. <laughs> I forget that one, right? Uh, every white knows of this intra-specific competition, intra-specific competition for survival and advancement, and acts accordingly. In fact, their doctrine of white supremacy has acted as a morale booster for their team, and as an implicit reminder that there indeed is a contest going on. They are all committed to this. To this, I'm actually kind of confused. This is page one sixty two for some reason. They, uh, they, so they are all committed to their side, which is why whenever the chips are down, all white power will gang up against non-whites. Why Russia and the USA will patch up their allegedly irre irreconcilable and onto the death dispute over ideology and defuse a Cuban missile crisis which would have wiped out the white powers and left the world to be inherited by the other races, which is why the atom bomb was used on Japan, but not on Germany, right? My son woke up, so... I'm going to say good morning, little boy. Um, all right, so I was trying to do this before he woke up. Let me see the comments I like, though. Um, uh, they would, so on and so forth. Uh, Kofi says, what is the name of your channel at Tanzan? Um, Trigger Happy says, okay, okay, I see what you mean. And also, cities and sheeties of Pakistan and India, right? Um, uh, Bobby Wright says, greetings. Uh, Tanzan says the name is uh, Swahili Nation. Tanzan, drop a link in the chat. Uh, Tanzan says many of our people are in different levels of denial. Yep. Um, just drop the link. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So he's like, look, the reason why they bombed the Japanese instead of the um, Germans was because the Germans are white. You know. In contrast, most blacks seem unaware of the competition, and all too many refuse to accept that if you are black, your team is that of the black race. That of the cardinal interest of your team is the survival, sovereignty, dignity, and prosperity of blacks, and that any other position would be unnatural. It is this contest between the races which creates the agenda that makes necessary a black world league of nations. And the main point on that agenda is the very survival of the black race. And its second point is the condition in which the race shall survive, whether in dignity or degradation, prosperity or poverty, sovereignty or subordination, which brings us back to pan-Africanism before the Fatia factor. So Fatia factor being before Nkrumah married out, right? So the main point of the agenda is the very survival of the black race. And a second point in the condition is the race shall survive, whether uh, in the condition in which the race shall survive, whether in dignity. Uh, yeah. So that's it. You have to you have to have it's like whatever. Just survive, 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 because the reality is these people will wipe you out. These people will wipe you out. They will wipe you out genetically or they'll wipe you out physically. But but they 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 can you know and if you're like hey now nah, they won't like ask the australian he was the other major factor you know they, they, like the four the four races he mentioned were actually five races described by blumenbach so blumenbach's the guy who um kind of makes the modern racial categorizations of western of, of europe and he actually says there are five races in the world the uh the caucasian the negro the mongolian the american indian and the uh, australian Right? Uh, no, I don't think this is the Negro. I think this is the Ethiopian, right? But he says the Australian. And yeah, the Australian is wiped out and the Native American is wiped out. That's it. Uh, and then the African, uh, if you look at Carl's Cooks, he's going to tell you two thirds of us were wiped out. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, let's see. I see. Dang, I don't care how to comment, but it's gone. Uh, greetings to at Bobby Wright, though, she says. So, anyway, I appreciate everybody for being through here. You know, I'm just trying to read this book. Uh, I'm just reading certain articles. I mean, if people want to read it themselves, the article, the book is in, in the description. I'm only going to read, like, a handful of them. So, uh, you know, you can still enjoy the, the, the good of reading on your own. Uh, uh, all right, so the, Im the impetus for Pan-Africanism came from the humiliating fact that by the end of the 19th century, the entire black world and the African homeland, as well as the diaspora, lay under a blanket of white power. Only two African peoples 
in Liberia and Ethiopia had states of their own, but even those were impoverished satellites to white power that in many ways was the nadir for the black race. Okay, Things had declined from the high point where black Egypt was a beacon of civilization to the entire world. And and don't ask Tanzan to articulate on that because Tanzan and Learning Curve will, uh, uh, Tanzan and Revolutionary Matron will tell you, hey, you know what? <laughs> Egypt was messing up too. Uh, to the point where the entire black world had been overrun by white power, right? The aims of the Pan-Africanism, uh, which this terrible situation provoked, were to roll white power off the backs of blacks to create independent and self-governing black states and through some unifying organization to get these states to create a power and a glory that would, probably, that would restore prosperity and dignity to the black race, right? Um, and through some unifying organization, yeah, so... This is where Pan-Africanism comes into play. Um, they're like, hey, because... And, it, and the thing is that I don't really think Pan-Africanism should be a response to white power, per se, but it, he's saying that it was a response to white power. Like, historically, this is what it is. And and the, the issue with that, I'll say, I'll admit, is that, like I said, people trade comfort for security. And if these white boys are giving you security, right, You're go and, and they're giving you discomfort, it's really they just have to do a balancing act at this point. They just have to do a balancing act. A lot of people, a lot of people, especially in the West, especially in America, a lot of people, especially people who migrated, immigrants and so forth, a lot of people believe that this is the most comfortable that they can have their existence in um, in the West. I mean, sorry, no, sorry, the most comfortable existence that they can have comfortably, you know, and that's that's the issue. You know, you have to you have to go between security and, and comfort. And, and a lot of people are pretty comfortable, you know. Uh, like, you know, they, like they, they get their PS5 and they, you know, whatever, you know, uh, Tanzan says, LOL, I'll leave Egypt alone. Yeah. Okay. Tanzan, uh, in the spirit of the movie, this, she was cursing. I was like, shit, you know, I was trying to hide my, hide some of my Egypt blood, you know, <laughs> it was the spirit of that movement as enunciated by Edward Blyden, W.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Claude McKay, and others, which prodded on such f African freedom fighters as Nkrumah, Kenyatta. Azikiwe and Sengar. Uh, they in turn galvanized countless Africans of their generations for the initial task of gaining independence for African countries. Hurrah, right? But alas, on leading their countries to independence, Africa's freedom fighters faltered on many points. They pretty much lost sight of the Pan Africanist movement itself and forgot the obligation its larger aims imposed upon them. Instead, the politically self governing states became petty ends in themselves. The idea of black solidarity was abandoned, and a thorough confusion of identity caused the movement for an organization of the independent states of the black world to be diverted into the dead end of an Afro Arab forum called the OAU. Even Senghor's efforts to keep F E S T A C all black was defeated, and even such of those historic tasks as were still pursued, such as the ending of racism and apartheid in South Africa, lacked the clarity and cohesion necessary for their effective um, execution. My son's here, so I'm kind of reading it like I'm reading it to a child, because he's a child. But anyway, um, yet despite the floundering of the past 25 years, the unfinished agenda is still there, waiting for us. It cannot be willed away for as long as the contest between the races of humanity lasts. Yet despite the floundering of the past 25 years, the unfinished agenda is still there, waiting for us, right? We still haven't finished our agenda. It cannot be willed away for as long as the contest between the races of humanity lasts. So, like, essentially, you're always going to be at war with or in contest with these other people, right? And the outstanding points on that agenda, first, the fostering of a sense of the primacy of black identity and the historic duties duties it imposes on all members of the black race. Second, the expelling of white conquerors from Southern Africa. Third, the abolition of black slavery in both South Africa and North Africa, especially in Mauritania. Fourth, stopping and see, see, look, a lot of us blame Gaddafi's end for black slavery. And he's like, no, black slavery was, was a thing and it's been a thing in North Africa. Fourth, uh, stopping Arab expansion south of the Sahara, particularly through the defense of the northern frontline states of Ethiopia, Chad, and Sudan against encroachment and dismemberment by the Arabs and their agents. Fifth, the monitoring of the condition of the black diaspora, especially the black minorities in the Americas, Europe, and Australasia, and the countering of anti-black racism wherever it occurs. So, yeah. All right. Sixth, 
fostering black solidarity through the popularization of the correct version of black history uh, through official observation of important events on the calendar of the black world and through celebrating the heroes of the black world from Menes to Mandela, Kamos to Kenyatta, Akhenaten to Azikiwe, Shabaka to Senghor, Nektar Rebe to Nkrumah, and Taharka to Tambo. So don't mention these, um, these, uh, <laughs> don't mention these Egyptian, uh, don't mention the Egyptian pantheon to Tanzan. Uh, Learning Crescent, I want my planet back, black man. You already got it. Uh, uh, Tanzan says, yes, indeed, not just in words. You feel me? Um, uh, so number three, she's going to say, oh, he's going to tell you who's, who, oh, he's going to tell you who these people are. Uh, so Menes was a unifier, the first fire of Egypt. Tanzan, I can hear you saying boo. Come on. Stop it. Stop it. She's all, boo. <laughs> Don't do that. That's Menes. That's my man's Menes. All right, whatever. Blandella. Uh, Nelson Mandela says, uh, freedom fighter and symbol of black resistance to white domination in apartheid South Africa. You can actually boo this guy. Uh, <laughs> Kamo says, Egyptian noble who raised the revolt that eventually threw out the Asiatic Hyksos invaders and ended their rule. Yeah. Jomo Kenyatta, uh, freedom fighter and first president of Kenya. Akhenaten. Uh, Egyptian pharaoh and religious revolutionary and inventor of monotheism. He's actually not a good guy. Azikiwe, uh, Azikiwe, uh, and Namdi's anti colonialist leader and first president of Nigeria. Shabaka is a Nubian prince who completed the conquest of Egypt, begun by his brother Pianke, and established the 25th dynasty of pharaonic Egypt. I like him too. I'm not going to hold you guys. Senghor, uh, he's cool too. A leader of the negative movement, first president of Senegal, and proposed a uh, sponsor of the first world. Festival of Negro Arts. Actually, I think he's married to a white woman. Uh, Nek Dar Habe, um, sorry, Nek Darabe, uh, last native Egyptian pharaoh during the brief reassertion of Egyptian independence before the second Persian conquest of 343 BC. And Kruma, obviously anti colonialist leader, first president of Ghana and champion of pan Africanism, who, who has his own problems too. Taharka is the 25th dynasty pharaoh who resisted a determined Assyrian invasion of Egypt. I'm actually going to put Taharka, I put Taharka in the top three Africans of our ancestry. Um, like top three of our ancestry. You know what I'm saying? Tambo Oliver, uh, freedom fighter, leader of the African National Congress of South Africa. So I guess, I think this is almost, no, okay, it's not over. All right, so we're going to go back up, see before we went. Oh, yeah, I forgot Tambo. I actually wanted to know who that was. Freedom fighter, leader of the African National. Oh, the ANC of South Africa. So, yeah, the ANC. Isn't that crazy? Um, anyway, so, because, um, like, right now, you know, we have, uh, we're talking about the ANC. Um, you have uh, Malema, who's doing an EFF, and he's like, yeah, I don't mess with the AFC anymore. So that's pretty interesting. There are some of the historic tasks which will await a world organization of black states. What is needed is an organization through which all black states, regardless of their internal arrangements, regardless of their outer, of their other external affiliations, can get together without outsiders to, um, to work for solutions for the historic problems of the black race. From the foregoing, it should be clear that a black world league of nations is a historic necessity and that setting it up is one of the historic tasks for the rest of the century. Now, I want to say this, actually, because this just got me thinking, you know, because I was looking at the 20th century AD, um, um, all that kind of stuff, right? And 4th century BC. You know, Wazungu, like, you're talking about doing festivals and fairs for Manes and, and Kamos. I don't know if Wazungu would be pushing it like that. Now, I'm not going to hold you guys. Actually, I was uh, minding my business at this job one time, and this woman says, oh, today's a holiday. And it's like a weird ass holiday I never heard of, um, which is like some Roman victory somewhere or something like that. And and she was just talking about it like casually. And I was like, what? And maybe they celebrate it locally where she's at or something. Or I think I asked her, do you guys celebrate that? And she's like, no, but I happen to hear about it historically. So that's not to say that people don't celebrate that kind of stuff. But I don't know, especially when we talk about the market research of today, whether people even care like, not to say that you shouldn't recognize Kamos, but would people do a holiday for Kamos today um, is is the question, you know? Uh, especially, like, now when nobody... Like, if you're going to a bunch of people... Like, you're going to people in Ghana and you're like, hey, you know, make sure you celebrate, you know, Nectarave, right? It's going to be like, eh. Especially with this hostile environment to... Hold on a second. This kid is, like, making a lot of noise. Um... Yeah, so, uh, like, you're making way too much noise. Come on. All right, 
So despite all that, uh, <laughs> like he's got to be like, he's got to be like, uh, F it, you know, you're the, you're the Baba. Um, all right. So again, appreciate the likes, family. Uh, sorry. So despite all that, we can express resistance to the project from all sorts of Africans uh, who are either confused about the implications of their racial identity or happily subservient to various anti-African interests. Particularly, some will retort, another organization? Don't we already have the OAU? Some others will say, an organization without our Arab brothers? Must we go it alone? And yet others will demand an all-black league. Wouldn't that be racist? So let me briefly answer some of these objections right away. All right. So about the OAU, it must be candidly stated that it was inadequate from the start, that time has only made it worse, and that its inherent perversions have become manifest. Now, actually, I will say this, guys. In the, in the Book of Power, I do analyze the OAU's constitution, and it really is crippled from the jump. Like, it, 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 it's, like it's like a demand that African states do not work together. You know, like you got to read through the Constitution and realize what it is saying. So I do analyze that also in my book. It's, it's like legit, like it was never going to work. Right. As a coalition of Arab and African states, it perverts the fundamental goals of the very Pan-Africanism, which was the impetus to its formation. It does so by including one branch of the white race, the Arabs, which has perpetrated and still is determined to perpetrate upon the black race, the very atrocities which Pan-Africanism arose to oppose uh, namely conquest, expropriation, slavery, and racism. Had the principle, uh, had the pri had that principle which excluded the white racist South African been applied with consistency in historical knowledge, it should have also excluded from the OAU all the Arab states of North Africa. But in the confused climate of the 1960s, in the euphoria of the anti-European solidarity, Africans lost their bearings, got confused about what Pan-Africanism was really about, and with Nkrumah's help, allowing allowed pan africans to be hijacked by the arabs and emasculated within the oau once that initial perversion is comprehended much of the oau's subsequent erratic career becomes explainable for instance it is significant uh just how many of these issues which have bogged it down have been arab issues whereas other issues which ought to have preoccupied it have been left untouched left lest Arab sensitivities be offended. Just consider Chad, the SADR, and the Ogaden War. In Chad, the OAU was bogged down and compelled to squander resources to contain Libya's, Libya, Libya's effort to grab and annex Chad, thus expropriating it for the Arab world. The conflict over the Saharu, Saharaui Arab Democratic Republic which obstructed OAU's deliberation on so many occasions and even kept it for quite a while from attending to the vital matters of Africa's economic collapse is in fact the conflict between various Arab interests over which of them should gobble up a slice of Africa abandoned by Spain. And as for the Agadin War, it became an instrument in the old Arab effort to dismember Ethiopia and Arabize the Horn of Africa when the Somalis were encouraged into it by Saudi promises to help on condition that Somali Somalia joined the Arab League. What is worse, this anti-African aspect of the conflict was not highlighted and opposed by the OAU. The premise of its conciliation efforts thus implicitly legitimized an unconscionable act of Arab expansionist brigandage. So he's saying the OAU was an organization that was siding with the Arabs on multiple occasions against the blacks. And, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, I think it was Trigger Happy asked earlier, why should the... Um, like, why did we even join it? It's like, no, the Arabs are supposed to confuse you. You know what I mean? The Arabs are supposed to confuse you. Tanzania says, try spiritually bribing them with spiritual gifts and material ones as well. Um, who are you talking about, Tanzan? Uh, are you talking about, yeah, like, let us know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm, talking, I'm trying to sound like, uh, I'm sounding like that guy, <laughs> Gary Coleman. What are you talking about? Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, you, if, you, if you can bribe people, uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, people have leverage over you, too. Uh, the, and these people, actually, these freaking Arabs had uh, leverage over a lot of the African world. Because you got to remember that 50% of, of, of Africans are in, in, on the continent are Muslims. You know what I mean? So, like, just imagine what kind of influence these, these Muslims have over them. You know? It's like just like the Vatican has influence over Catholics. You know, the the imams of 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 the Arabian world, you know, where Mecca is the 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 Saudi Arabia. I don't know where it is. I don't know what country it is, but uh, I think it's Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, I think he's saying the Saudi promises, the Saudis, you know, if if you if you have Mecca, then you control the Muslim world and uh, then you control 50 percent of Africans. 
because they're they're suckered like that. I want to show you guys. I don't know if I put it up on. I think I put it up on Twitter. But there's this uh, article. I didn't even. I didn't really read it though. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Uh, there's this article by. Um, uh, this article talking about the Chinese dictator, and what? The, oh, sorry, not the Chinese president, but the Chinese president, uh, where he he basically says, "Yeah, we can have Muslims, but we have to make them pro Chinese," you know, and it's like, and I, I think I asked the question like, should we do something like that as well, you know, but but that's that that's the that's the big difference between us and them they understand that um like they understand i wish i could find it it's probably on the discord though but there there was this article like psh, i can't even find it but there's an article like i said like they they look at the spirituality and they say um like like the chinese have muslims too and they say look we're going to make we're going to promote islam but we're going to promote it as pro-Chinese. So we're going to change it fundamentally because they recognize that it's pro-Arab. You know what I mean? And this is the president of China saying this. So it's, it's just, I wish I could find the article, but I guess I can't. So, you know, just take my word. Or follow me on Twitter or, or, or follow me in the Discord or whatever, right? Or ask again sometime, right? So whereas the OAU has been bogged down by such issues... It hasn't found it possible to raise such issues as the enslavement of blacks in Mauritania, the Saudi-led Arab financing of the dismemberment of, of the Ethiopia through Muslim factions and Eritrea. And, and if you guys know about the Ethiopian civil war going on, or not civil war, but whatever going on right now, it, it relates to this Eritrea and Ethiopia divide. In fact, if those of you don't might not be familiar, Eritrea took over the Ethiopian government, or some people, I think it was Eritrea, right? Uh, or there's some faction in Ethiopia. I don't remember it, but um, they take over the Ethiopian government, and the Ethiopian government just recently uh, got liberated from that. You know what I mean? And this all is underneath OAU's nose. And if you look at the constitution of the OAU, it, it's kind of like don't interfere with other states. You know? Uh, and why don't they? Why don't you? Because they know that if you are not interfering, if you're not collectively organizing for your defense, for your security, right? Um, you know, as long as they are collectively fighting you and you can hold them back and make them feel, make them look stupid, you can get away with a lot of shit. And these Arabs do, you know, are the Arab Afri African Arab conflict with the Sudan. Uh, Sudan had to break up eventually. You know, these topics have been taboo and OAU and, 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 and it broke up without the assistance of the OAU, more or less. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, honestly, but still uh, these topics have been taboo and OAU where such issues as would top the agenda of a genuinely pan-Africanist organization cannot be raised, an OAU that is distracted by dissensions arising from Arab adventures against um, Africans cannot claim to be the fulfillment of the pan-Africanist dream of an organization for ending the humiliation of the black race. Actually, when I said I wasn't sure about the Sudan thing, I mean, I was because the OAU was disbanded and replaced with the AU. So, yeah. So the perversion of, of including, and it's, the AU is pretty much the same thing there. The perversions of the including Arabs aside, the OAU, as is well known, is also under the thumb of the Western powers who still manage to wield more influence in it than all the African members put together. When these facts are taken into account, one must conclude that the OAU was conceptually and operationally a disaster for Africans. I would even go so far as to urge that the freak organization be disbanded, for it is an impediment which is masquerading as a channel for African liberation and advancement. But again, it was disbanded and is replaced with the AU. Same damn thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, less neutered, but the same damn thing. And it's not replaced with the BWL, which is, again, you know, you have to position yourself in such a way. You have to, like, we have to be active and really about it, about it. Because if we're not, it doesn't matter what we write. It doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what we think. The wor other people who are organized, you know? I think that was one of the core tenets in, you know, my website. That's website, African Blood Siblings, right? Um, uh, .wordpress.com, whatever, right? Um, and I had like a list of core tenets, like core philosophical beliefs. And one of them was like, uh, organization, no, misorganization is defeated by organization. You know what I mean? Like, like it doesn't even matter, uh, how, like, like the organized people win nine times out of 10. 
that's like a fundamental premise of of reality the organized people win against the misorganized people if you want to fight organized people you have to or be an organized people that's it and so you can you can disband the oau and what's going to follow it is the au you know like like i said this brother boycotted this this uh this corner store this bodega that was disrespecting black women apparently like it might be like slapped a black customer and so they 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 uh, he, he, he organized the boycott. And after the boycott, what happened? The store was replaced with a footlocker. That's it. It wasn't going to be replaced with black thing because you're not organized to replace it. So so the white boy who's organized to replace it says, oh, look, cheap real estate and goes puts a shoe store. And now black people are going to the shoe store. And, you know, this black man feels accomplished because he got these Arabs out. But at the end of the day, his people are still, you know, subject. You know what I mean? Like, like if you want liberation, you have to get organized, period. You know, uh, be a part of organizations and so on and so forth. Um, so let's see. To those who feel uncomfortable at the idea of breaking out of the Arab African embrace, who think that solidarity with others requires that we sacrifice our separate identity and organization, a question demands to be put. Don't those Arab brothers of yours have their own separate Arab League? Have they disbanded it? We're in the black world equivalent of their Arab League. You know what I mean? Like they have it. So what the freak, bro? All right. So whatever the merits and demerits of Afro Arab solidarity on certain issues that should not blind us to our own our need to have an organization all to ourselves. They refuse to create a separate Pan African organization in the original and proper sense of Pan African as black world would be like sheep insisting that jackals always be present whenever sheep meet. That way the sheep can never get to discuss how to rid themselves of the menace of the sheep eating jackals. Right? Uh is this the last that's no, not the last page. Okay. Uh objections even violent objections to men to any organization exclusively for the black race can be expected from those Africans who are victims of the various pseudo universalist doctrines which make white hegemony acceptable to its victims. For instance, African Christians with their dream of a universal human brotherhood in Christ, which is a thing that they say, and you've got to realize, you've got to recognize that, in which all are equal without regard to race and likely to look with revulsion at the prospect of a black world organization whose doors will be barred to their white co originalist religionists i don't even say religion so i don't know so two african muslims with their passionate desire for that dar el islam where there is no racial discrimination so two african marxists with their preoccupation with that abstract universal working class in which racial considerations are either abolished or taboo of course like deluded people they mistake their dream world for the real world and like the mad behave as if their dream world were already here right um Again, he's he's telling he's spitting facts, okay? But we need all the same to understand such absurd behavior. Those white sponsored universalisms have strong appeal for those blacks who are anxious to escape their racial particularity into some alleged universality. They are usually people who, overwhelmed by white supremacist propaganda, have come to accept that the black race is inferior, despicable, and only fit to be escaped from by anyone unfortunate enough to be born into it. And since they cannot remake themselves into whites, though many try to bleaching their skin and brainwashing their minds, the only way of escaping from the despised black race is into some universalist community and identity created by whites and left open to all comers who need a sense of proximity to the whites. It is of such people that Marcus Garvey said, so many of us find excuses to get out of the Negro race because we are led to believe that the race is unworthy, that it has not accomplished anything. Cowards that we are. It is we who are unworthy because we are not contributing to the uplift and upliftment and upbuilding of this noble race. So um, he says, because we are led to believe the race is unworthy and that has not accomplished anything. Uh, cowards that we are, it is we who are unworthy. You know, we have to realize this, that we have to ourselves contribute to the building of our race. Let me see the comments, though. Uh, Tanzan says, I was referring to that African deity whose worship you wanted to revive. How to get people to start worshiping? Bribe them. Uh, which African deity? <laughs> uh, Bobby Wright says, the so, Sawari Republic is the Western Sahara territory controlled by Morocco. Yep. Um, Tanzan says, organized people win. Agreed. Um, uh, I I, th I think I think those people were were were, were humans. Um, like to hark on them. Um, uh, like I think they were he people. But uh, what such Africans will or menace to? What well, what such Africans will not face up to is that these versions of universal human brotherhood have failed to address the core of the historical problems of the black race, and their proprietors have also inflicted or proved unable to stop their racial brothers from inflicting conquest, slavery, and racism upon blacks. You know, basically these white people come up and they're like, "Oh yeah, we want brotherhood," and you're like, "Yeah, sure, let's get brotherhood." And their their brothers come and kick you in the face. 
And so you have to start thinking to yourself, wait, 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 wait. You know what I mean? Like, you, you can't, you can't, like, like, I mean, and the brotherhood thing is just stupid anyway. Like, because you're going to destroy yourself genetically. You know what I mean? You're going to destroy yourself genetically. Um, like, there's no ins and outs of buts. You're, if you start mixing with other people, you're not, like, you're not going to survive. You know, it's like the Native Americans. Some of these Native Americans today are just white people. You know, not even like five dollar Indians. They're like legit, just like mixed so much that they're now white. You know, uh, upon blacks, what their fake doctrines of universalism succeed in hiding from their African inheritance is that their alleged color blindness is but a gimmick to keep blacks from organizing separately to tackle the problems imposed on them across the lines of race of color. Those Africans who are so eager to flee into any of these allegedly universal. So there was a there was a footnote somewhere. Flossie's opinions of Marcus Garvey, page six. Oh, so that's where he had the quote. Uh, Those Africans who are so eager to flee into any of these allegedly universal colorblind communities, Christendom, Dara, Islam, the world proletariat, tend to cower at the thought of being accused of anti-racist racism by their white friends. Let it therefore be made clear why such accusations are false. Okay, somebody left a comment here. So Pan-Africanism does not claim that black race is superior to any other and should rule others. That would be black racism. So that would be black racism. Now, again, I think that you should want to rule other people, honestly. Um, like, you should have rule of your own land. And when you rule your own land, you rule other people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, just like when, uh, when the Americans, the white Americans, rule this America, they're ruling other people. They're ruling me and so on and so forth. You know? So it's, it's like I don't necessarily call that, you know, white supremacy or anything. He didn't say that. But, you know, I don't necessarily whatever. And I think that America, white America, should, inside of America, promote white white race is superior and they should uh like one of the things i picked up on i was watching this european um like skits you know like comedy skits like a comedy team they had some thematic skits that i i, I found funny right and but they when you hear them talking casually they mention captain america thor uh they as one of them asked the other person have you watched the game of thrones right so to say that they're consuming american media just like anybody else now the difference is that American media is kind of geared towards Americans, and it and it does, and it's in it, and of itself have this pro America, pro whiteness, right? And I don't and like and so if you're consuming it and you're not in America, then you're gonna get this pro America, pro whiteness paradigm. You know what I'm saying? So like the people in Europe are gonna like people in France or or Belgium or whatever are gonna get this pro American sentiment from Captain America, right? And they're supposed like America's supposed to do that. Now, what, what, what the issue is that we, we watch it and we consume it ourselves and then we complain that it's there and we say it shouldn't be there when it should. And you're not going to win another people by saying, no, don't make Captain America. You know what I mean? Hey, make, don't make Captain America, make Captain Zulu. And like, why shouldn't he make Captain Norway instead? You know, why is he making Captain Zulu for you? What is he doing this for you for? What, who are you? You know what I mean? And, you know, you might be like, well, I'll help build this. Like, he doesn't care. And it's like, like I said, I'm not even going to go into that. But he doesn't like it's not, it's not even something that somebody would consciously do is 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 like like nobody. You know, I think I was uh, in the in the shoot the breeze and Azuli said something like nobody wants to be a slave. Right. And like, yeah, I wasn't disagreeing with him, obviously. But the the thing is that if I'm going to write a story and I'm a white person, a white American, and I'm going to say, what country is the best country on the planet, if you will? It's probably going to be a Captain... Or what country do I want my my people to... What, it's probably going to be a Captain America thing. You know? And the idea that I should probably write a Captain Zulu instead of a Captain America so that African Americans could feel well because of what uh, my white ancestors did against African Americans at one point doesn't even make any damn sense. Why would I do that? Especially if I know, like I said, the market research. I know that though... I know, first off, that white Americans want to read positive things about white america but then black america also does so it's like it's like a lose lose if i write about zulu and when i do write about zulu captain zulu or like black panther black people are on my ass about oh black panther was written by a white boy so it's like you can't even fucking win if you're a white boy and not to say that white people should be winning i'm just saying that like realistically that's why like that's the angle that i would take um hopefully you guys don't mind that that was a little bit of a Tangent. <laughs> uh, a little bit of a tangent. All right, so pan Africanism is simply uh, concerned with the unification and upliftment of the black race and with the development of its civilization. Now, that does not constitute racism. 
Now, this looks like it's probably important because it's highlighted, so let's see what it is. Those who accuse Pan-Africanism of racism are actually opposed to the prospect of that black unity which would exclude whites from meddling in matters of vital interest to blacks and so limit the ability of white races to infiltrate, disorganize, and dominate the black world. The charge is predicted predicated on the gratuitous error of equating the racial with the racist. To be racial is to be limited to members of a given race. To be racist is to believe in the inherent superiority of a given race. Thus, an organization can be racial without being racist. This distinction is vital, and any attempt to gloss it over must be resisted. Glossing it over is what allows racists to weaken resistance from victims of their own racism by claiming that any anti-racist organization must be multiracial, thus enabling racists to join undermine and sidetrack it from a determined assault on their cherished racism right so exactly you know this is this is good this is actually good right and i want to just say this though whites wanting to stop you from resisting them makes a lot of damn sense if they're trying to be aggressive okay uh and that's what it is some of those who accept the need for a separate black world organization may still prefer that it is called the African or Pan-African League of Nations and that uh, may do so for residual unease about it using the racial term black. Those who are squeamish about being called black or Negro are free to substitute the term African, provided they recognize the equivalence of the terms and use them correctly. After all, an African is defined as a Negro, a member of the black race, a native of Africa. Thus, a white African is a contradiction in terms. In particular, Arabs being whites native to Asia and Arab Anglo Boers being whites native to Europe are not Africans, whatever their pretensions, and they cannot legitimately be included in an African or Pan African organization, so long as that rule is clearly understood as not violated which has been in the OAU, there should be no objection to the substitution of Pan-African for Black world. By the way, for the definition of African, the term Black African is tautologous. Though the redundancy is judged useful for distinguishing Africans from the white settlers in Africa, it is dangerously misleading insofar as it lends credence, lends credence to the idea that there is such a thing as a white African. It is practical harm as it is a matter of including Arabs in the African organization is ample reason for putting it out of use. A black African is simply an African. White settlers in Africa are simply white settlers in Africa. So what he's saying here is that instead of saying black African, right, which is something that Jope actually says, though, right? Uh, instead of saying black African because it's tautology, it's a tautology, it's like redundant, right? Um, uh, you should say African. You know what I mean? Um, um, because an African is black. Uh, and, and if you say black African, what it, it lends to the idea of a white African, you know? Uh, so that's a pretty interesting um, kind of thing. So some, some, I, I, don't, I like saying black African, uh, but I also see why he's saying that we shouldn't say it, right? And I'm just explaining what he's writing, right? While on this matter of language, we might as well attend to a misuse of the term black, which is spreading from the USA and Britain to denote all non-white groups which suffer racial discrimination. So <clears throat> nearly full of junior. Right. So thus, Pakistanis in Britain are suddenly regarded as blacks. This metaphoric use of the term ought to be strictly discouraged because before we are told and find gullible Africans accepting that Pakistanis, Mexicans, Vietnamese and even Turks and Arabs are black simply because they are discriminated against in Europe and America and that they should therefore be admitted into any organization of the black race. So sometimes you'll actually hear people in America like the Irish used to be black. It's like, no, no. You know, <laughs> like, no. Furthermore, the use black as a metaphor for victimage and being oppressed is to lend credence to the view that they are the natural lot of the black race. To be oppressed is not our natural lot. It has only been our lot in recent history. All races have suffered oppression at some time or other in history, and we would be stupid to allow blacks to be seen as the badge of victimage. Uh, besides the very point of a black world league of nations is to end the oppression of blacks, not to perpetuate it, not even in matters of symbolism. Blacks should therefore cease to be the symbolic color of victimage and should become the symbol, if anything, of victory against oppression. In fact, this matter of propagating cor correct usage of words like African and black and of any of the racist association which have accumulated on them should be added to the agenda of the black world league of nations, right? And that's a, that's a good point. Uh, but unfortunately, it looks like white's the one who's going to look like the symbol of of, of, of of whatever, you know. You might have to start 
you know, I'm just messing. All right. Having indicated at some length why a black world league of nations is absolutely necessary and why objection to it are untenable, it remains simply to emphasize that in the context of the competition between the races, if you are black or African, your team is the black race. And it is futile to pretend that it is not. It is naive in the extreme to think you can wish away your racial identity and substitute for it some changeable class identity or an adopted religious identity that's the abas i, I put the religious people in the abas if you guys don't notice uh on my, on my podcast enemies within check it out all right furthermore a rat doesn't cease being preyed upon just because it dressed up like a cat and thinks it's a cat what is done to rats will be done to it until rats get together and cut off the claws of cats um what do i want to say about this i did i did have something else to say but i just uh um yeah. Oh, yeah. So here's where one of the issues it comes in. Right. A lot of black people are beginning are be, like more and more black people are becoming mixed or sorry, not even more and more black people. What I want to say is more and more mixed people are are are, are coming into the world and they uh, are are pretending to be black and yet they're expressing their expressions are towards this wishing away their racial identity you know and i shouldn't even say more and more i i want you guys to know so like i said i did find the ebook for this book called from superman to man good like like i have top three fiction books obviously one of mine's is one of the best obviously but it's based off of um zubiri no so zubiri is based off of two other books from superman to man and um well not based off of but inspired by from superman to man and blake or the huts of america right so in Blake's of the Huts of America, there's this conversation between this mulatto and this African, right? So this is like, he's writing this in 19th century, okay? He's writing this among, uh, like, while African people are still enslaved, right? Blake's of the Huts of America was written, it's a revolutionary book, like, a, like, a, like and by revolutionary book, I don't mean like it's new or whatever. I mean, like, he's talking about revolution, right? He's talking about inciting a revolution in Cuba or something, right? Uh, but anyway, he's like, they have a mulatto there, and the mulatto's like, why should we join the African cause? And and Martin Delaney articulates why a mulatto person should join the uh, the uh, African cause, right? But of course, that's a long time ago. And the question always and the question and the reason why he even dresses the question because the the style of r- literature that I like, you know, from Superman to Man or from uh, the one that I wrote, Zubiri, or the one Blake and Hutz America, is that the the style of literature is that you're answering a question, you know, like you have questions throughout, and and somebody's intelligently responding to the questions. So Zubiri gets a whole bunch of intelligent questions and he addresses them. The same with um, the people like Blake and them. And so I think it was Blake who who explains to the mulatto guy that, you know, he explains to him why the mulatto should be a, a part of uh, African, you know, empowerment, right? Uh, that said, you know, the reality is this, that a lot of people are not familiar with that literature. And, 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 the reason, and the fact that it's a question in the 1850s means that it's, a, like, it's probably going to be a bigger question today. So a lot of quote-unquote people who are not black, okay, who are mixed, but are identified as black, particularly in America, will, at, will try to wish away their racial identity. And they can do it. But as they're articulating and we, everybody else is looking at them as black, things, that's where the problems come in. So uh, I think that's a really um, important thing to, uh, you know, touch on while we are, are here. So I see some comments. Uh, Tenzen says, yes, exclusivity is the key. Gatekeep. Um, yeah, gatekeep. She's like, gatekeep. Like, we have to be exclusive. Kofi says, I agree with him on the black African thing. I, well, you know you do, Kofi. K- Kofi is like, Kofi's on it. You already know. Uh, all right, so this is the last paragraph right here. Nigeria, with its size and resources, with its pretensions to be to being the black, the giant nation in the black world with this desire to be seen as a champion of black liberation cannot afford to oppose such an organization without thereby making it quite clear that it is the giant obstacle to the liberation of the black race. After all, the objectives outlined above for such a league are precisely some of the inescapable steps towards the liberation and rehabilitation of the black race from its centuries of subjugation and humiliation by others. So, Chin, Chin, so about the author, Chin Weizu is an institutionally unaffiliated Afrocentric scholar. So he's not a part of any institutions. And that's what I'm saying. That's the sad part. It's like, here you have this, this, this genius, right? And he's, he's not even affiliated with any sort of institutions, you know? And the thing is that 
you know, it's like it's like I think it was Bobby Wright, the the other one, not the one in the chat, but Bobby Wright, unless that's the same person in the chat, I don't know. But Bobby Wright was like, um, you know, we have the people and they have the institutions, you know. And the thing is that people can change so many other people. Like we could change hundreds of people, right? But institutions can change millions, and 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 it's just a matter of scale. It's like uh uh uh. You know, I think one of the words that Alma Bookman was using in the uh, last chat was um, something along the lines of economies of scale. Oh, no, sorry. Inside of the Shoot the Breeze, she was like, oh, we just don't have the economies of scale. Let's talk about the word cultures of scale now. Like, how are we do, how are we how are we propagating cultures of scale? You get what I'm saying? So these are the books that he wrote, The West and the Rest of Us, um, um, in 1975, and he enlarged it in 1987, Invocations and Admonitions. Uh, Decolonizing the African Mind, Voices from 20th Century Africa, Anatomy of Female Power in 1990. He's also the co-author of Towards the Decolonization of African Literature. His pamphlets include The Black World and Nobel and The Recolonization of Reparation. Uh, he lives in Lagos, Nigeria. So um, somebody, uh, I think Black Paradox, he keeps telling me I should read this book. So you guys let me know how this book is. Uh, I'm thinking about getting a handful of these books. Uh, but yeah, that's it. That's the, uh, oh, feel free notice. Hey, feel free for you to comment on this uh, information to any publisher you produce it, unedited in its entirety to the Pan-African community, provided you credit the author, do not change, cut, otherwise, so on and so forth. Um, and he, he said this in 2007. So that was it. Um, and look, this is the next one, but I'm probably not going to read this one. Can Muslims peacefully coexist? Um, like we probably already know. I mean, you guys could read it on your own. So you don't even like hearing me. Uh, as proven by the lack of views, but it's all good. You know what I mean? <laughs> Trick Abby says, had to step out real quick. How is the article so far? Uh, it's end. That's how it is. Uh, no, nah, it's pretty good. Uh, he said, uh, Trick Abby says, okay, never mind. This is the end of the article. Yeah, man, I feel you. I mean, I, I just kind of do it random timing, but it's realistically, you know, it's a YouTube video. I, I Technically, once upon a time, I used to read stuff and not do them live. And I used to not read them live. I used to just read them. And so on and so forth. So I'm glad you guys joined me. But of course, you can always watch the playback. It's going to be here all the time. Oh, speaking of which, my son's here, right? So we can probably do the Shemmy Hotep together. Hey, come here, boy. Uh, so I want you to say Shemmy Hotep. Shemmy Hotep. Shemmy Hotep. Uncle Ja. Uncle Ja. Seneb Neb. Seven Neb. Amen. Amen. Ma'at. Ma'at. Dua Nature. All right. <laughs> Is it Dua Nature? Endstream. All right, whatever. Endstream. Yeah, okay. You <laughs> got it. <laughs> Ha <laughs>